Hello, good day everyone and uh, welcome back to the channel Master Marina Ramit Sangwan. In continuation with our tanker work videos, this is the next video where we are going to see oil tanker equipments, the equipments what we used on board the ships. Okay, now we'll go one by one into all of these uh, equipments. So first is some publications are basically referred to take out this uh, equipments one is equipment manufacturers and instructions manual which are normally kept with the chief officer reference is being made to isgot international safety guide for oil tankers and terminals and uh, code of federal regulations 33 part 125 to 129 and equipments are required required as per these the first equipment what we need on board the ship Okay, there are many equipments, but the first equipment what we are going to discuss is the loading or the stress computer. That's normally called the loadicator on board the ships. Now, what is this loadicator? The loadicator is an instrument which is provided to supplement the stability booklet for the vessel. Now, all the ships need to have a stability booklet, right? So, loadicator work can work as an alternative to your stability booklet. It has all the information in it. You know, if you take out your stability booklet and if you go for calculations, it is a time consuming process, but the same thing with the help of a loadicator, you can do it at a very fast speed because it's a computer. Now, it allows the officer responsible to carry out various complex calculations required, ensuring that the ship is not overstressed or damaged during the carriage of nominated cargoes. It also permits the assessment of damage stability. The master and chief officer will make themselves aware of the worst case damage stability condition within the stability booklet. Okay, you know, when you're loading and you're discharging, where your loading is at a very fast rate, you're discharging, it's a, it is at a very fast rate. If you go and calculate using the stability booklet, it is basically going to take a lot of time. And if you use the loadicator, it is really very fast. Within some few clicks, you are going to get answer you're going to get your damage stability, you're going to get your intact stability, you're going to get your calculated drafts, freeboard, displacement, dead weight, everything is in front of you in, on the screen. So this is continuously used. You can easily monitor and continuously monitor. You don't have to refer to hard books. Now it must be remembered that loading computer as with navigation aids, aids is only an aid to the operator. You know, this is uh, prone to some mistakes because ultimately it is just a machine. It can make mistakes. And if the human beings, if the operators make some mistakes, the loadicator is also going to make, make mistake. The loadicator is working for us. Whatever we tell it to do, it will do. If we do something wrong, that result will also be shown wrong. So we have to be very careful while, you're, while using this loadicator that it may give wrong results. This loadicator relies on human input data and more importantly, the human interpretation of the output data. If the input data is incorrect, the output data will also be incorrect. Used correctly, it will ensure that the safe operation of the ship for all conditions of loading, discharging, ballasting and at all stages of the voyage. It is a company requirement that where such equipment is provided or to a ship, test condition must also be supplied for use in verifying and accuracy of the equipment. It is the company policy that test condition must be run against class approved cases and record records of results maintained. Now, along with the loadicator, there will be another book which will be approved by the classification society, which has the test conditions. Every now and then you have to put in those test conditions manually inside this loadicator and you have to check the results and then you have to compare the results given by the loadicator with the results which is given in your booklet. The results should match. If the results are not matching, that means you have some problem with your loadicator. When and when these test conditions will be tested, will the condition for testing this is as soon as possible after the change of the chief officer, because this is the he is the cargo officer on board the ship. So whenever a crew change happens and a new chief officer comes in, he should check the loadicator as soon as he joins. One condition is that then the second is it should be tested every three months and the third is prior the vessel proceeding to the dry dock. That is the third and the fourth is during each annual and special survey in the presence of the attending surveyor. When the attending surveyor checks this, test this loadicator, the test condition has to be signed by the class surveyor 
the testing what you have done the result has to be maintained in a file so that tomorrow if somebody asks you during an inspection whether you are testing this load indicator or not you can basically show your test condition that yes we have been testing and the results given by the load indicator remember the results given by the load indicator should be similar or should be the same what is given in your test condition if there is any variation that means your load your load, no load uh, your load indicator is not working properly now the test what you are carrying out is to be conducted by physically entering the data for each tank into the computer and verifying the result it is not acceptable to simply retrieve the stored test condition from the computer and compare this against with the official conditions okay there are certain conditions fixed or already saved inside the load indicator you cannot click on that to test the load indicator for testing the load indicator you have to actually take the readings from the test condition put it inside the load indicator manually and then take out the test results saved test condition should not be used during annual and special survey class survey should be requested to witness the test and endorse the test result or issue a survey report this record is to be maintained on board so whenever this annual inspection is happening the class inspector will basically test how you are testing the load indicator once the testing is done the report which comes out it has to be signed by the class surveyor the frequency and records of such tests are to be recorded on the vessel's plan maintenance system where running of these reveals significant errors the company is to be advised immediately with the request for attention if your load indicator is not giving accurate results then the company has to be advised of the problem where online gauging of tank contents is not fitting or now not fitted to the load indicator must be regularly updated in order that stress is draft and trim and can be monitored throughout the discharging operations now it happens that during most of the load indicators most of the shifts the load indicator is online that is it is directly taking data from the cargo and the ballast tank but there is a possibility that it is not online that is you have to manually feed this figures inside this load indicator and if that is the case then that this has to be done very often mostly it has to be done every hour so you can continuously monitor stresses if it is online then it is not a problem because online it is continuously taking up the data from the various tank and it is giving you stresses every minute so that's a good thing if you have it on board if you don't have it then at least every hour you have to put the data manually inside it and you have to check the stresses during loading and discharging operations that's about the load indicator gentlemen although the video is going to be long but we are going to cover all those equipment in one video itself we cannot have so many videos just for one uh, topic so second equipment what we have is the pv valve that is the pressure and the vacuum valve all the tanks have to be have to have a pv valve pressure vacuum valve this acts as a means of venting and in fact most of the ship three valves is the primary means of venting the pv valve be se will be separate independent of the ig line and independent of everything else so in case there is excessive pressure inside the tank or if there is there is excessive vacuum inside the tank the pv valve will operate and it will either it will release the excessive pressure or either it will break the vacuum by sucking in air so the pressure vacuum valves are designed to provide protection of all cargo tanks and provide for the flow of small volumes of tank atmosphere resulting from the temperature variations of the cargo tanks and should operate in advance of the pressure vacuum breaker p valves are to be clearly marked with the high pressure and vacuum opening pressures the correct maintenance of these valves is essential to the safe operation of the vessel a spare pv valve for each type fitted is to be carried on board so this is a requirement by by requirement by sire also that a spare pv valve should be carried on board in case if you have problem one of the pv valve this can be replaced and the other pv valve can be repaired every pv valve is to be dismantled over a 12 month cycle interchanging with spare valve this is to be done on the ballast voids with tank open to atmosphere and all supply valves to the tank shut maintenance maintenance is to be required by the maintenance makers instructions on reassembly the valve tightness is to be tested using soapy water that it is not leaking and each pv valve is to be numbered and a record to be kept of all the maintenance of each pv valve maintained in the plan maintenance system so you have to see where when you are going for loading and discharging then you have to manually lift up the valve to see that the pv valve is working every 12 months decarbonization of the pv valve and overhauling of the pv valve should be done and the testing of the pv valve is to be done then during every dry dock this pv valves are picked up and it are taken to the 
uh, yard and their calibration is carried out. Next is you have flame arrestor gauges. Now this flame gauges, screens on PV valves, hijack type valves, vapor lines, moisturizers, purge pipes, PV breakers and uh, all alleged ports are to be inspected every three months and replaced as necessary. Flame screens on ballast tanks and bunker tank one bunker tank vents must be inspected every six months and replaced as necessary. The purpose of having these flame arresters is that even if there is a flame outside, it will not allow the flame to go inside the tank. The flame arrestor will arrest it. Basically, this flame arrestor is nothing but it is a wire mesh. What the wire mesh, what you put on the window so that the mosquitoes don't come, on, come inside. This is the same kind of a wire mesh. If you put this wire mesh, this does not allow the flame to pass through it and this flame wire mesh is put on the palace tank vents. It is also put on the PV valves, hijack type valves, vapor lines, masterizers everywhere so that the flame does not pass inside. Okay, the next is PV breaker. Although I have made a separate video for PV breaker, you can watch that video, but we will discuss it here also. The PV breaker is actually an additional safety measure. It is connected on the IG line. And if the pressure inside any of the tanks is excessive, in fact, it is if the all the tanks are commonly connected with the IG line, if the tank pressure is excessive and if the PV breakers are not able to cope up, then the PV breaker operates. All right. To, to know more in detail, please watch that additional video which is there on PV breaker. So every inert gas system is required to be fitted with one or more pressure vacuum breakers or other approved devices. These are designed to protect the cargo tanks access, against excessive pressure or vacuum and must therefore be kept in perfect working order by regular maintenance in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. When these are liquid filled, it is important to ensure that the correct fluid is used and the correct level maintained for the density of the liquid used. The level can normally only be checked where there is no pressure in the inert gas tank main. Evaporation, condensation, and possible ingress or sea water must be taken into consideration when checking the liquid condition, density, and level. In heavy weather, the pressure surge caused by the motion of the liquid in the cargo tanks may cause the liquid in the pressure vacuum breaker to be blown out. When cold weather conditions are expected, liquid filled in the breakers must be checked to ensure that the liquid is suitable for low temperature use and, if necessary, antifreeze is to be added. So, in order that in the cold climates, this uh, liquid inside the PV breaker does not freeze, we add glycol to it. The glycol is an antifreezing agent. It does not allow liquid to freeze. The PV breakers are to be clearly marked with the high pressure and vacuum opening pressures and also with the type and volumetric concentration of antifreeze, a water fill type and minimum operating temperature. So this has to be marked on the PV breaker. Please watch that additional video which is being made on PV breaker. Then we have the deck seal and the non-return check valves. So this, I have made the video on deck seal and non-return valves also this. In addition to this, please watch that video also so you, you will have a better understanding of it. Okay, so deck seals and non-return valves are basically devices which do not, does not allow backflow of the IG to the machinery spaces. Ahead of the deck seal is the hazardous area where they may, there are cargo vapors. Behind the deck seal is a non-hazardous area where there are no cargo vapors. The purpose of the deck seal and the no return devices is that the gases and the vapors from the hazardous area do not go back to the engine room spaces or the known hazardous area. So on vessels fitted with an inert gas system, it is a requirement to maintain a positive seal between the cargo tanks and the inert gas generation plant. This is accompanied by the use of a non return valve and a deck seal. The water seal and non return valve ensure that the cargo tank atmosphere cannot leak back into the engine room or the inert gas generator because if they leak back, that is a hazardous area. There is a source of ignition there. There is air there. And if the vapors get, get there, then a fire or, a, or an explosion hazard may occur or a fire or explosion hazard may happen. In vessels fitted with a venturi type or a dry deck seal, deck water seal, particular care must be taken with inspections of the venture in on return valves and or orifice plates, plates as applicable to ensure that there is no corrosion or damage, which would allow excessive carryover of water into the inert gas piping system and cargo tanks. Filters in the system must be removed regularly for inspection and repair if necessary. That is, we are talking about the demister pads. 
depends upon your company requirement every six months or every 12 months or every quarterly it has to be taken out and removed and the shoot has to be removed from it shoot is the black partic carbon particles which get get deposited on it that is we are talking about the dimester pads now when vessels are trading in cold areas it is essential that the deck seal heating system are checked as being operational so there is a steam coil passing through the deck seal which should be kept on so that the water inside the deck seal does not freeze during carriage of flammable cargoes including where there is a pre presence of flammable slops on board the deck seal duct seal pump shall be kept operational on a continuous basis and all alarm systems relating to the pump pressure or level of water in deck seal shall be kept in the full operation so the pump room or the deck seal pump should be continuously kept running so that the cargo so that the water inside the deck seal does not freeze Deck seals and non-return valves should be opened up at periods so not exceeding 12 months for inspection of all inter internal parts, venturies, etc. So that is a requirement by the company that the deck seal and the non-return device shall be open at least once every 12 months for inspection to see that the condition is okay. Then you have the tank gauging system. The components of all cargo and ballast tank level gauging system are to be operationally tested prior to every cargo operation and inspected clean as required according to the manufacturer's instructions every six months. Then the tank gauging system is the system that gives you automatically reading of the ballast and the cargo tanks inside your CCR so that you can continuously monitor the level, but they have to be maintained at least once every six months or as per the manufacturer's instructions. They may or they may not show correct reading so you don't have to rely, uh, please don't rely on it 100% make, always keep in mind that this is a machinery, this can also always feel so if your tanks are at a high level, use manual gauging. If the vessel is to load a static accumulator cargo in a non inert atmosphere, the fixed tank gauging system must be in full working order prior to cargo operation. This is because if you're loading a static accumulator oil, that means the static charges will be there and you will not be able to use your UTI in this uh, non-inert atmosphere. And in that case, the only means available for you is the fixed tank gauging system to see the, to monitor the level of the cargo inside the tanks. And that is why the system has to be working properly and you have to make sure that it is working properly before you are starting the cargo operations. Comparison readings between fixed and portable gauging systems should be taken at regular intervals throughout the loading discharging periods in order to ascertain any discrepancies between the systems. If the vessel is loading a static accumulator cargo, the vessel must comply with the measuring and sampling system contained in the ESGOT. Okay. Now, every hour or every two hour, depending upon the loading rate, the comparison should be made between the portable gauging system, that is your UTI and the fixed gauging system at regular intervals. Maybe it can be hour or an hour, uh, or two hours or every, half an hour depending upon the loading or the discharging rate but make sure that you follow if you are carrying out this gauging in known inert tank then you must refer to the procedure what is given in the is got okay that is measuring and sampling known inert tanks but in the new is got the section number is different so you have to refer to the new is got because we have a new revised is got now then you have the pump room bilge alarms. This pump room bilge alarms are to be tested every weekly and prior to every cargo operation. So if any cargo leaks inside the pump room, the first indication what we're going to get is either with the bilge high level alarm or by the fixed gas detection system. And so this bilge alarm should be tried out every week so that we know that in case of a leak, we come to know immediately, even when there is a small amount of leak, we can come to know and we can control. If there is a more leak and if the water liquid level inside the pump room rises, nobody will be able to go inside the pump room also and it will be a big trouble. But if you are able to stop the leak when it is a small leak, at least we will be able to repair it. Next is you have the pump suction strainers. The continued efficient operation of the strainers are present basically before the pump so that it does not allow any debris and dust particles or anything else to go into the impeller of the pump and damage the pump. So for that purpose, we have the pump strainers so it can filter all the debris out and only the oil is or liquid oil is passed to allow it. So the continued efficient operation of cargo pumps requires that the pump suction strainers are kept clean as follows. The main cargo some strainers are to be opened up for inspection and cleaning at least once every six months or so every six months you have to open up the strainers basically this is uh, before the pump on the suction side 
Now cargo stripping pump suction strainers are to be opened up for inspection and cleaning at least once per ballast voyage after tank cleaning has been completed. It may be different on your country, the in a different in your company, different time duration is given, but normally it should be done before every uh, cargo operation after every discharge. Now ballast pump suction strainers are to be opened up for inspection and cleaning at least once every year so that if there is mud, sludge or anything else that can be cleaned and the pump runs freely. Then you have the pump safety devices. These are the devices on the pumps which you have to monitor. These are basically these protect the pump from uh, getting damaged and you have to make sure that these are working properly. So cargo and ballast pump safety devices are to be tested at least once per loaded voyage just prior to the first discharge port or monthly on voyages of short duration before commencement of discharge and satisfactory completion of the test and appropriate log entries to be made. So this pump safety devices are to be checked such as the high level alarm, high temperature alarm. Correction, it's not high level, it's high temperature alarms. Then you have the tank cleaning equipment. In this, you have the tank cleaning machines. So the tank cleaning machines, when, on, when, on, when not being used regularly, are to be checked in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions at least every three months. The tank cleaning hoses are to be checked for electrical continuity before each operation. Should there be any doubt about the condition deterior deteriorating since last routine testing, otherwise every three months. These are basically, we are talking about the portable hoses here. They should be checked for electric, electrical continuity. The electrical continuity should not be more than six ohms per meter. The resistance should not be more than six ohms per meter. This has to be checked every month and then the record of the same has to be kept. It can be checked by the side inspectors. Then you have the cargo tank pressure alarms. These pressure alarms are there on all the tanks. Is they are independent, so that we can get an indication of a high pressure alarm or a low pressure alarm. Uh, these are these are also considered as a secondary means of venting. The primary means of venting is a P valve. The secondary means of venting is the cargo tank pressure alarms. In the tanks, you need to have two means of venting: primary and secondary. Primary can be a P valve. Secondary can be a second P valve. And secondary is if if it is not a P valve, then you need to have a cargo tank pressure alarm. This can be incorporated with your sub system or tank gauging system. This is the setting is very important. The setting of this alarm says that the higher pressure alarm setting should be equal to P V valve setting plus. 10%. So if your P valve is setting is 1400 mm WG, then the high pressure alarm will be 10% of 1400 plus 10% of 1400. That makes it about 1540 mm WG. The bottom pressure should that the tank should never be in negative temperature pressure. It has to be always in positive pressure. No company may require something some positive pressure they may require 100 or they may require 200, but at any point of time, your tank should be under positive pressure. Okay, so to meet the requirements of Solar Chapter 2, Part 2, a secondary means of full flow venting of all tanks is to be provided. This is typically the combination of IG line, PV breaker, vent riser, plus individual tank PV valves. An alternative means of compliance is for a pressure monitoring and alarm system to be fitted. At this, the secondary means the alarm is required to go off at a higher pressure than the PV valve. The following points are critical. The alarm setting for the pressure sensors must be set to activate when the tank pressure or vacuum reaches a reasonable margin of safety above the normal actuation settings of the pressure vacuum valves themselves. These pressures are to be clearly indicated in the cargo control room. And during operations, loading or discharging, the audible alarm must not be disabled. Okay, so inside your sister, it happens that many a times they give a kit, they keep giving off alarms, and the duty officer gets irritated and he disables this alarm. This should not happen during the cargo operations or during any other operation during sailing. Also, this alarm should not be disabled. Wetting inspectors will frequently ask what the alarms are when what the alarms are set and then for a demonstration of the system working so the wetting inspectors will ask you how what at how much the alarm is set and they may all also ask you to test the alarm that you testing you can done by changing the setting inside the sub system as a guidance as to what the level as as to what level to set at the pressure alarms masters are referred to the most recent OCMF Oil Companies International Marine Forum Vessel Inspector Questionnaire VIQ Petroleum Tanker should set the alarm 
ten percent above the design opening setting of the pressure valve, which we just just a little bit little uh, little while ago. With regards to the low pressure alarms, this will vary depending on the vessel's inerted state. Okay, so for inner tank, the pressure in the tank should never be permitted to fall below zero, and so the pressure sensor with the IG system required the inert gas code and solars should be set at a positive pressure that is 200 mmwg low and 100 mmwg low low this is for inert gas tankers should the low pressure alarm sound or there be a failure of the ig system discharging operations must be suspended immediately and that is why you have seen that inside your ccr there will be a trip of your cargo pumps if the ig pressure goes below 200 mmwg the uh, your cargo temp cargo pumps immediately trip but you can bypass it also. So there is a bypass, but you should never bypass. You should left it on. So even if you are not monitoring the IG pressure all of a sudden, if the IG fails or if the IG pressure goes below 200 mmWg, the pumps will trip and the cargo operations will stop automatically. Otherwise, your tanks might go in vacuum. With regards to individual tank pressure alarm sensors, they should be set to positive. 50 mmwg in order to give warning in the event the main ij alarms have failed or an individual tank isolation valve has been accidentally closed for non inner tanks the sensor should be set at a vacuum 10 percent greater than the normal actuation setting of the vacuum valves normally you will not find non inner tanks all the oil tankers normally are inerted tanks only very rarely we find non inner tanks that can happen in your uh, oil cam tankers where you're carrying gasoline and gas oil or products like that Chemical tankers and small tankers not fitted with inert gas system may by design be capable of discharging to a higher vacuum, which could be up to 20% of the pressure valve opening setting. In such cases, the master should refer to the ship specific operation instructions or contact the office for advice. Now, please ensure all cargo watch officers are fully aware of the above requirement and notice is to be posted in the CCR. Notice should be posted in the CCR, which consists of alarm set points, procedure to be followed in the event of alarm sounding, a notice stating that the audible alarms are not to be disabled. You should note that this only refers to the alarm fitted on the tankers where the alarm system is provided to meet the requirement for a secondary means of venting. Remember, this alarm system is a secondary means of a system. If a vapor recovery system VRS is fit, fitted, a pressure alarm will be also be fitted in the vapor return line. This must be set to actuate before the PV valve design pressures. The USCG requires this alarm to be set as follows. Now, if you have a vapor recovery system fitted, this alarm should be fitted 10% before your PV valve lifts up because this, allowed, this gas is not allowed to be released to the outside atmosphere. It has to go into the vapor recovery system. Mm -hmm. If the vapor recovery system is not able to cope up, then your PV valve will be lifted up. And if your PV valve is lifted up, the air, the gases will go outside in the atmosphere, which is not allowed. So the alarm setting has to be 10% before. So the moment you hear the alarm and you see that the vapor recovery system is not able to cope up, you are either going to uh, reduce the loading rate or are you going to stop till your till everything is okay until the time the vapor recovery system can cop up alarms at high pressure of not more than 90 percent of the lowest pressure relief valve setting valve in the cargo venting system that is equal to 10 percent lower than the PV valve setting the pressure side alarms at low pressure of not less than four inches water gauge that is 0 0.144 PSIG for an inerted tank ship or the lowest vacuum relief valve sitting in the cargo tank venting system for a non inerted tank for ship. You can refer to CFR Code of Federal Regulations number 4639.2013. Now, full details of a vapor emission control system will be in the approved ship specific vapor emission control manual. You have a vapor emission control manual on board your ship, and this will give you the full details of that. Then you have the pressure and the temperature gauges inside the ship. Inside, you will also have your pressure and temperature gauges fitted on the individual tanks. All manifold and other pressure instrumentation with the cargo system is to be checked annually for calibration and records of such calibration has to be maintained. So, so, so all your uh, pressure gauges and temperature gauges has to be calibrated. You have a cal shore waste, you have a calibrator on board your ship and this is to be used for calibration of your pressure and temperature alarms. Vessels are supplied with one test gauge certified for this purpose and other gauges are to be checked against the calibrated gauge. 
Gauges are to be checked within plus minus 10% of the certified gauge and a certificate issued by the chief engineer. An entry is also to be made in the deck logbook that the pressure gauges have been tested. The certified gauge is to be used only for calibration purpose. Any gauges which cannot be calibrated to within plus or minus 10% of the certified gauge are to be replaced. So when you are testing this pressure gauges, it should be the within 10 within plus minus 10 percent of the rated pressure gauge otherwise it should not be used new gauges have to be ordered temperature gauges are also to be checked on an annual basis calibration should be carried out during repair periods or if suitable calibration instrumentation is supplied in lieu of such calibration then comparison reading should be taken between local and remote thermometer readings so as to provide a practical cross reference okay this is to be done to calibrate the temperature and pressure gauges okay the next is tank high level and overfill alarm high level alarms are set at basically 95 percent so alarm shall be properly set and tested prior to its cargo operation for this purpose they shall be set they should be set at a higher level than 95 percent normally this alarm is also incorporated with your sub system gauging system Tank overfill alarm, these are independent alarm, independent of your gauging system. So all tank overfill alarms should be tested by manual lifting of the float or other local test device prior to each cargo operation according to the maker's manual. These alarms have to be tested before every cargo operation. Tank overfill, overfill alarm are to be switched on and must remain operational during all cargo operation. This includes loading, discharging and cargo internal circulation. Even during discharge, a tank has to be has the potential to overflow if cargo lines are not correctly set tank wells are leaking or excessive trim is there so you need that that so that you have to make sure that all these uh, alarms are it's uh, are in a switched on mode during your, any cargo operation or during any transfer operation is going on log entries are to be made confirming the tank overfill alarms are active are active with any defects being advised to the office immediately the audio and visual alarm positions on tank on deck must be clearly identified with a stencil of 50 mm height in block liters and on and uh, on white paint and written tank overfill alarm that is why you see this tank overfill alarm wherever it is it is very highlighted that as tank overfill alarm if each tank has a different alarm the tank must also be identified normally you don't have an alarm on each tank you have an alarm on each tank but the sensor is common it sounds in the CCR, you will be able to know which tank is alarm is sounding, but outside on the deck, you will just hear a tank or fair alarm. On the deck, you will not be able to know which tank it is, but, it's, but inside CCR, you will be able to make out which alarm it is on by the looking at the screen. In the event of a tank or fair alarm sounding, only the alarm should be acknowledged and investigated immediately. If the reason for the alarm cannot be established, the cargo operation should be suspended and the master advised immediately because you don't know whether your tank has gone beyond 98% or not. So you should suspend your cargo operation. You should properly investigate. You should not think that if this was a false alarm, this could lead to a leakage. The following steps should be considered when investigating an overfill alarm. You have to recheck the lineup of cargo lines and associated valves. Wherever practicable, the recheck of the line should be from a cold start. That is, all valves to be confirmed shut and lined up as required by the cargo plan. You have to check the alleged of the tanks in alarm condition by independent means to verify the alarm and check the trim of the vessel. So you have to, if you get an overfill alarm, you have to immediately stop all the valves and you should check the manually you have to check the level of the liquid inside that particular time to see that whether it was a false alarm or whether it was because of the trim or whether for whatever was the reason you have to investigate the reason whatever is the case maybe gentlemen it may happen that actually the level of the liquid inside the tank is more than 98 percent and it could lead to a spillage should the cargo operation require any changes then cargo plan must be amended and approved before the commencement of commencing the operation so if required you may have to amend your cargo plan so that this uh, cargo can be transferred to some other tank then you have the tank radar systems this is basically basically to measure the automatically measure the level of the cargo inside the tank today's days cargo operations are really fast tanker operations are very fast you know you cannot just keep on taking manual alleges every now and then you have some you need to have some fixed system which by which you can continuously monitor the level of the tank inside the tank 
although when you are topping off the tank that time you have to do it manually but during bulk loading and discharging you can use the tank radar system but this has to be compared with manual uti after every one hour or after the frequency as decided by the cargo officer depending upon the rate at which you are loading so this tank radar system such as equipment must be maintained in working order at all times and calibration check utilizing utilizing the uti portable gauging temperature equipment should be carried out as per pms during each cargo transfer operation records and results of the checks are to be maintained calibration of the fixed equipment by third parties will be carried out as required after replacement repairs of any of the existing units or at manufacturer recommended intervals whichever is more frequent normally this uti is so this calibration is normally done once every five years when the ship goes into the dry dock, but comparison has to be made during every cargo operation using a manual UTI. Incidents having occurred where tank radar alleged indicate indications are failed to indicate correctly without warning, usually after cleaning of the transmitter antenna as per the manufacturer's instructions, the correct indication is restored. All vessels fitted with tank radar alleged systems are to carry out regular cleaning of the radar antennas as, car as cargo carriage allows. So out during every ballast voyage, this antenna of this tank radar system has to be cleaned with a clean cloth. It has to open and clean. Sometimes this tank radar gauge is also give wrong volumes, but if you clean the antennas, they will probably give you a uh, correct reading. Even if it is not giving you a correct reading, you have to ask for service technician of the same company. He will come and he will repair it. Then you have the last equipment, you have the oil discharge and monitoring and control equipment. If you're a tanker work, but tanker man mostly will be aware of it. Why do we need this? All the tankers need to have this. A tanker cannot sail if their oil discharge, monitoring and control equipment is not working and not functioning properly. So vessel fitted with equipment for monitoring the discharge of affluent, affluent from slop tanks must ensure this equipment is operational before any discharge is made. The operation of this equipment must be in accordance with the approved oil discharge monitoring and control systems operational manual. So you have this manual on board the ship, which is oil discharge monitoring and control systems operational manual, and you have to operate this equipment according to this manual. A calibration check according to the manufacturer's manual is to be carried out at intervals of one month. That is, you have to test the ODMA equipment. It is done by the chief officer every month. The system must be calibrated on annual basis by the manufacturer or company authorized manufacturer. So on an annual basis, it has to be calibrated by the manufacturer or any company which is authorized by the manufacturer to carry out the calibration. The printed records of the, of the monitoring equipment, the printed records from, of, uh, the, from the monitoring equipment must be retained on board for inspection by the surveyors that you have been continuously uh, monitoring this equipment and uh, testing this equipment. We will make a separate video on how this ODMA system works. Otherwise, this video is going to be too long. We cannot discuss everything in detail. This is just a familiarization of the, all the equipment what we have on board the ship. Next is the portable hermetic gauging and sampling unit. That is the samplers are used to take sample from the cargo and the hermetic gauging is the manual UTI or the MMC what you use on the tankers. So every vessel must be provided with a minimum three units capable of closed measuring of alleges and temperatures. One unit shall be capable of determining interface readings. So you have, you should have at least three UTIs that is alleged temperature interface. These UTIs are used to measure the level of the liquid inside the tank, they measure the allege. And also the interface, the interface is the interface is the place where the both the water and the liquid, the uh, actually mix, uh, but uh, water and liquid never mix. Water is at a lower level, oil floats on the level of the water. When the UTI touches the difference, that layer where water and uh, the liquid matches, that is called as the oil and water interface, basically where they come face to face with each other. That one, at least out of three, at least one should be capable of measuring this interface between the oil and the water. Prior to each use for de determining cargo quantity and the equipment shall be checked fully operational and calibration of the temperature sensors checked against a certificated, certificated reference thermometer. Prior to using it, there is a certificated thermometer. You should check the thermometer uh, temperature of water or any liquid. And with the UTI also, you should temp check this uh, temperature and you should make sure that um, it matches. Apart from this, this uh, yeah, yeah, portable UTIs have to be sent annually to the manufacturer to carry out their servicing. Okay, and calibration temperature sensors checked against a certificated reference thermometer. 
each instrument shall be calibrated by an independent organization per annum. Earthing requirements of the instrument must always be complied with as per the manufacturer's instructions. This bonding connection must be tested by the chef staff prior to its cargo operation. And if any abnormalities are found, the instrument is to be withdrawn from service until rectified. Every vessel shall also be provided with a closed sampling device. So before you use this UTI, you have to make sure you ground this UTI. There is a clip at the end of this UTI. You clip the clip you basically connected with the LH port and then you put the UTI inside because there can be static charges inside which can lead to a fire or an explosion inside the tank. Normally inside inner tank it should not happen but nevertheless you should ground the UTI first. There is a clip given at the end at the end that you should connect it to the to, to, to any point on where the LH, the LH port is. Similarly a closed sampling device is given just like the UTI, you could, it is closed, you can put it inside the LH port or and you can withdraw samples with it. Then at the end, you have the high velocity pressure vacuum valves, somewhat similar to the PV valves. High velocity valves are designed so that no flame screen is necessary as the speed of venting of gas will carry away from the tank any flame or spark. Having a vent secured partially open at the times will permit lower exhaust speeds and hence may permit a source of ignition to enter the tank equally as vent lashed in a certain position will not be able to open fully and could lead to tank over pressure situation. For these reasons, valves must not be lashed open in any condition. Okay, so these high velocity vents, they do not have the same spark screens just because the because the velocity with which the vapors will be coming out will be very high and they will be taking up the flames along with them. These valves should never be lashed in any open condition because the amount of vapor coming out may be very slow and they may not be able to prevent the flame from going inside. All right. These are some of the equipments which are being there on the deck of a tanker which are very useful. Gentlemen, this, is, this video will be very helpful for you to familiarize yourself with various kinds of tanker equipment and uh, uh, if you want to just read it you can go through slowly i had to go a little bit fast otherwise the length of the video becomes too long gentlemen thank you for watching this video i hope uh, it will be beneficial to you it will be beneficial for the boys who will be going on the for the first time on the tankers or who are already on the tankers who are junior officers or who are appearing for the mates or second mates exams uh, thank you for watching this video, gentlemen. Uh, help me by subscribing this channel. And uh, if you actually feel it is useful, then you can also share it with your friends. Subscribe this channel. Subscribe Master Marina Ramit Sangwan. That motivates me to make uh, more such videos. Thank you. Thanks a lot, gentlemen. And uh, have a great day and uh, have a great uh, time always. Thank you. Take care.